Hi everybody, apologies, could you close Apologies for the slightly late start. Um, I'm Dr Vicky Glover and I am talking to you about perinatal and postnatal health. I'm just going to send a little message to the OMVP girls um, just to let them know that I think I'm live. I'm live. Um, can you see me? I hope you can. Um, um, so the topic, so I'm a GP and I've been a GP for about 10 years and I have two children, uh, a five-year-old and a three-year-old and, um, obviously working mum. Um, sorry, just diverting my gaze down this way a little bit to see if anyone can see me. I think there's 18 people watching, I think. Aha, success. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about several things today and you're welcome to send me message, like questions and I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't know the answer, I might know some resources or direct you to your own GP if it's very specific, um, but I'll do my best. Um, so the things I'm going to talk about today, um, I'm going to do, kind of divide into a maternal and a baby section. Um, bleeding, so maternal section bleeding, a little bit about stitches, uh, a bit about breastfeeding resources, uh, hot flushes, mental health, six week check, what happens, sex, contraception, pelvic floor and parental leave and then baby things really more about, um, <coughs> pardon me, you can tell I've got a bit of a sore throat, um, about mental health, uh, sorry, about babies, uh, six week check, vaccines and some basic things. A lot of it's been covered already um, by the midwives yesterday and the infant feeding team so um, there'll be a little bit of repetition but uh, I don't know if it's the same people tuning in or not so I just thought I'd throw it out there. <coughs> Sorry. So, um, bleeding. Basically, once you've had your baby, um, you can expect a very heavy period. Um, the first couple of days, changing a pad every couple of hours is not unusual. Um, and it can be quite tricky to manage. Um, you have to be quite prepared for things. Um, but that settles down and by sort of day 10 to 14 is like a sort of regular heavy period, if you like. And that bleeding for the majority of women will probably settle down between two and three weeks. But it's not unusual at all for it to go on for six or even up to eight weeks sometimes. But by the time you see your GP for your six to eight week check, <clears throat> it should have stopped. Or you should have had a period of time where you have definitely had a break from bleeding. Um, so that's all quite normal, really. Um, the thing that we get concerned about with bleeding is if you haven't had a break from bleeding um, by around eight weeks, then we'll probably send you for an ultrasound scan um, just to make sure there's no retained placenta. And if there is retained placenta, it's quite, it's a relatively straightforward thing to have that removed. I have to say, um, anecdotally, after a C-section, people tend to have a little bit less bleeding, not always. Uh, breastfeeding mums tend to, uh, you get good contractions of the uterus when you're feeding um, and so that you tend to get a little bit heavier to begin with and then it tapers off a little bit quicker but there is really no rule um, as long as you've had a break in bleeding by your six to eight week check that's fine. Um, I can't see that there's any comments or questions yet um, so uh, if anyone from MVP is watching and I'm supposed to press a particular button, please let me know. Um, I can see a little little speech bubble. Um, I just hope it's working. Um, so that's anyway, that's bleeding. Um, stitches. So there may be different places where you will have stitches, of course. There'll be the abdominal stitches for a C-section. Um, they're absorbable stitches. Um, and they can feel a bit tight sometimes, but that's scar tissue just as a scar tissue knits together. It, it does draw and it does feel a bit tight sometimes. You can occasionally get a little um, end poking out um, and that's nothing to worry about. It can feel uncomfortable and it can rub sometimes, um, but try and keep your clothes loose um, and uh, it will absorb. Um, you can trim them so that they're flush to the skin, but sometimes if you end up with a tiny little bit poking out, actually that can get caught more. Um, so we don't advise trimming them. Just try and just keep everything loose over the top. Oh, it's all working. Brilliant. <laughs> oh, a question. Um, any signs or symptoms to look out for for abnormal bleeding those first to six to eight weeks? So heaviness isn't really a very good guide. Um, you will sometimes have clots, particularly if you're breastfeeding and as you feed, you'll get a very powerful contraction, um, which can be painful, uh, can be very painful. Um, so you might get more clots or blood loss after a breastfeed. Um, things that I would be concerned about, abdominal pain, 
Uh, so you shouldn't really have abdominal pain. Sometimes a bit of aching maybe, but it shouldn't be painful as such. You can get a little bit when you're feeding and you've got that contraction, but that's it quite easy to identify really. Um, so pain, funny smells. Um, so it should smell like a normal period. Um, it shouldn't smell malodorous. It shouldn't be stinky or fishy. Um, and then colours, so it should look like a period. Um, it shouldn't be yellow or green. Um, if it is, you're probably going to go to your GP anyway. Um, but if you notice that, speak to your GP. <clears throat> or if you're still under the care of the midwife, speak to your midwife. And they can give you a swab to self-swab, but almost certainly would give you some antibiotics. And just arrange to follow you up with a phone call or just a little review just to make sure it settles down. Big question. Are you more likely to tear again over previous stitches and will this affect healing? So scar tissue is more fragile than normal tissue. Um, if you've had an episiotomy in the past, um, you are, I don't know the statistics of it, but I would imagine that you're more likely because that, that tissue, the perineal tissue is very soft and fragile anyway. Um, and it's prone to tear during labour. So I would imagine that you are probably are more likely to tear. I don't know the statistics. Will it affect healing? No. Um, fantastically vascular area, very rich blood supply. Um, and the things you can do really are try not to disturb it too much don't be pulling pulling it apart to see if it's healed um it's not that wide <laughs> um but um you know eat well rest um let your body do its thing um i'm 39 plus three to, uh, question from some a lady hi i'm 39 plus three i notice pain on my bits area maybe your baby's on its way um Okay, pelvic floor question. I'm going to come back to that one if that's okay. Um, so going back to stitches and stitch care, really for the abdomen, it's just about loose clothing, nothing pressing too tight. You'll find it uncomfortable. Um, you might sometimes get a little bit of oozing, um, just a small amount, nothing more than would soak through a normal, regular plaster, really. So if you're getting more than that, keep an eye on it, keep it open to air. So that means walking around with your, your pants or your trousers right down um, and a top up so you can really... I'm showing you my tummy, but <laughs> it's open to air um, and that will help. For the vulva, uh, the perineum, really there's nothing major you can do. No prolonged walking. Hopefully you're not going to be doing that in the first couple of weeks anyway. Um, sometimes a salt bath. If you think there is a bit of an ooze or maybe a little bit of discharge, you could put a little bit of sodium bicarb or a little bit of just regular salt in your bath just to soothe that and, um, and that'll make it much more comfortable. A um, couple of questions. When do you start doing pelvic floor after birth? Okay, well, let's move on to that. So pelvic floor exercises, basically, do them while you're pregnant and never stop. Um, pelvic floor exercise is fantastic. They're going to help you with urinary continence. They're going to help you with your labour, when you know when to squeeze and when to not squeeze um, to help, help bring your baby into the world. Um, basically, you can do them as soon as you like, as soon as you feel ready. What you'll find um, is that it's harder immediately after birth because all that pelvic floor muscles have to stretch out. Um, it's all been pressed down on and it's going to slowly knit back together, which is why, sorry, I'm just chuckling. Someone said, would you recommend spritz for bits? I've never heard of that. What is spritz for bits? I don't know if I can recommend it because I don't know what it is. Sounds intriguing. Um, so, um, yeah, if you do no pelvic floor exercises, your pelvic floor muscles will come back together and you will increase the tone. Um, but because everything's been pressed down or because you've been bearing down through labour, um, you won't have the same amount of tone as you did prenatal or pre-pregnancy. Um, things. So there's an NHS app. Um, if you Google NHS apps, there's a list of the library of apps um that the nhs recommends and in there is squeezy which um i have i think basically every woman should have um this is what it looks like and you can click on here um squeeze now and it talks it times you through um how long to squeeze for and it's quite difficult to do 10 seconds and then you have time off and then you do it again so you do 10 squeezes times 10 seconds and then you do 10 times one second, um, three times a day. And the good thing about this app, so it's not a free app, but it's, uh, I think it's about 2 99 and it's very, it's very good. It, I, I really like the timer. You can have it with sound or not. Um, and uh, it's just a gentle little click thing. Um, and um, it sends you notifications to remind you. Um, I 100% recommend that. 
There's also patient.co.uk has um, a really good information sheet with pictures for pelvic floor exercises. And the way that I describe doing pelvic floor exercises is to imagine you've got a tail and you have to flick that tail up so the tip of your tail touches your belly button. So um, really drawing round and up. Um, someone once said to me, it's as though if you had a tampon in and you thought it might fall out, those are the muscles you've got to squeeze. And I think, although it, it's not a great thing to visualise, actually, it works. Those are the muscles. Um, I'm just going to have a quick read of these questions now. Um, I bought witch hazel tea tree to put in pads and spray bottle. Is that OK? It's not required. Um, so whether it's OK or not, um, I don't think there's any evidence one way or the other on that one. So it's not something that we advise. Um, witch hazel, you have to be quite careful. It's quite astringent, so it can really sting. Um, so if you do need an episiotomy or you do have a graze, and pretty much if you don't have an episiotomy, you will have a small graze there, um, just because of the stitch, so, um, just because of the, the birth. Um, I would be cautious about using witch hazel or tea tree, to be honest with you. Um, from what I know of aromatherapy and oils, I don't think it would be likely to cause harm, but I wouldn't use it. Um, does witch hazel and aloe vera actually help with soothing and healing? I've heard to soak pads with them, keep in the fridge for feeling, when feeling sore. Um, there's no evidence that that's true. Um, so, no, is going to be my answer on that one. <clears throat> I've checked, it looks like two purple var varicose veins on clitoris. It's a bit of pain when I bend or walk on stairs. What do I do to solve it? Um, give birth is the first thing. Um, basically, the, the great blood supply to the, uh, to the perineum, to the vulva, um, helps us during labour, helps us um, all the time, basically, with our pelvic floor, continence for the bladder, continence for the rectum. Um, so it's a very, very rich blood supply. And what happens during late pregnancy, you've got a big baby in the way. And so the blood goes into those vessels and it struggles to get back out. Um, and so um, there's not much you can do about varicose veins to the vulva while you're pregnant. Once you are pregnant, essentially keeping your bowels regular. So you're not straining, you're not bearing down into that pelvis too much. Um, that will help. In terms of Eunice Anasol, um, it's not advised to be honest with you. Anasol has some steroid in it and some topical um, anaesthetic. So it's not gonna do anything for the varicose veins. It's going to reduce a bit of inflammation. But to be honest, varicose veins don't cause too much inflammation of the tissue. They're just swollen vessels. Um, the local anaesthetic, it might help a bit, but again, actually just um, some frozen peas wrapped in a flannel, cold ice pack, cool bath. Those are the things that we would advise. Um, Hang on, here we are. Spritz for bits. Is a spray supposed to be amazing for soothing bits post-birth and can be used on cesarean scar? Well, um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's in it, so I'm not sure. But I would say that it's quite easy to be... Um, I think pregnancy and postnatal is a very vulnerable time where lots of people, us mums, you want to feel that you're getting it right and you're looking after your body as well as you can. <coughs> but actually, fundamentally, we don't need many products. We don't really need any products um, apart from water. Um, so I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't go spending your money on something that you don't really need. Um, yeah, but I'm just going to click see if it says, says see more. Well, let me see. If someone could send me a post that has what the ingredients are in spritz for bits, I could maybe give you some more advice. I don't know. Um, so, okay, so I think we've kind of covered vulva um, for a little bit. Um, next thing I was going to go on to is breastfeeding resources. Um, the videos from uh, OMVP from the other day from the infant feeding team, really, really excellent. And we're really lucky in Oxfordshire that we've got some really uh, highly qualified um, feeding support um the my resources that i recommend for ladies uh first is the infant feeding team at the jr um they are fa fabulous ladies um there's also a service at the horton so i'm just gonna have a have a sip um and how it works if you google jr feeding team um there's the phone number there it's not there at the moment because of coronavirus they're not offering the service from the hospital they direct you to oxford to your breastfeeding support 
um, normal times, there's a phone number on their website. You phone them up and leave a voicemail with your concerns. Um, and then someone will phone you back and either they'll signpost with you um, to various other resources if there's something they can help over the phone or online. Or they'll bring you in for their clinic for a one-to-one. -one. At the moment, Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support is offering one-to-one -one, um, FaceTime sessions, a bit like this, but obviously it's two-way. Um, and a lot of the local groups are offering that as well. Um, so really fabulous service. So Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support and the JR Infant Feeding Clinic, they're my top two. Um, we're very lucky in Farringdon. We've got a wonderful midwife called Beth who runs a breastfeeding support group. Uh, she's a peer supporter and she's fabulous. Um, and I know there's several dotted around the county. So there's also one in Wantage that uh, some of our mums use. Uh, you can go, there's Abingdon, I know. There are... Uh, there's La Leche League, a uh, fantastic website, full of resources, all sorts of different things on there about tandem feeding. If you're feeding your elder child when baby's coming along as well, um, feeding twins, different positions or about storing milk. Really uh, very trustworthy website. Um, so that's La Leche League, L-A-L-E-C-H-E League. <clears throat> There are also national resources. So the Association of Breastfeeding Mothers, ABM, um, fantastic. And um, if any of you mums after um, you've had your babies are interested in becoming a mother supporter or being a peer supporter, their training is highly regarded. Um, there are there's the National Breastfeeding Helpline. Um, I think it's a midweek service, uh, Monday to Friday service. Um, but again, highly qualified individuals. And it's just a case to pick up the phone. Um, and I believe you can ask your Alexa to dial it for you or to ask. You can ask Alexa for advice um, from the National Breastfeeding Support Line. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, there are lots of independent, well, not as many as we'd like, but there are some independent um, lactation consultants um, dotted around uh, the country, the world. Um, and they most of the time you would what I would look for if I was going to go to an independent person to a lactation consultant is they are what's called IBCLC um, and IBCLC International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. Um, so that's uh, just a, a marker of qualification, really. I'm just going to check my message just to just see if anything else has come up. Um, no, great. Um, so, yeah, my, my top resources are Phone the Infant Feeding Clinic, Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support, ABM and National Breastfeeding Helpline. I noticed on one of the videos the other day, someone was asking about, is it OK to take um, NSAIDs, i.e. ibuprofen or aspirin uh, postpartum? And uh, the, well, the answer to the question was given and it is yes. <clears throat> but there's a fantastic website um, called Bumps, which is Best Use of Medicine in Pregnancy which has um, all the information for um, um, public to use and also professionals to use. Um, so it tells you about, um, yeah, whatever medicine you might want to look up. So, for example, at the moment, antihistamine is quite a, a common question we get asked. Um, then that's for during pregnancy. Then there's the breastfeeding network is its kind of sister group um, for postpartum. So um, if you're breastfeeding and you want to know if a medication is safe, if, for example, they have general anaesthetic ingredients, they have all the antibiotics, uh, pretty much every ingredient that you might be prescribed really is on the breastfeeding network. And um, they have a wonderful pharmacist called Wendy Jones, who if you're prescribed something or you have... Um, uh, someone wants to prescribe you something and perhaps is advising you to stop breastfeeding, check that website first. Because as doctors, our training in breastfeeding is not that great. Um, most of what we learn is self-driven. Um, so it's very variable what your GP will know. We know the common things. Um, but if you're not sure, particularly if you're keen to continue feeding and you've been advised that you need to stop, use the breastfeeding network. Um, and if your ingredient or your drug that you've been prescribed isn't on there, then message them. Wendy is absolutely fabulous. And she, if she doesn't know off the top of her head, then she'll find out she uses international um, pharmacology and various other pharmacists basically to uh, to help guide, guide the answer. So very, very trustworthy. I could just see a few more comments here. Um, right, let's have a look here. Spritz bits ingredients. Uh, peg 40. I'm not really sure what that is. I think that's in quite a lot of things. I don't know what it is. Castor oil's fine. Perfume. Why would you spray perfume on a scar? Was it boy bits? It's not needed. Uh, Tocopheryl acetate. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what that is. I think that's a, um, 
I think that's what they used to bind uh, oil with water. Uh, witch hazel tea tree. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't use it. I wouldn't use spritz, spritz bits or spritz dot bits. Um, uh, there's another thing here with some more, more ingredients. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can't see the full list that you're giving me, so I'm sorry, I can only see the first two lines. But based on the fact um, that it bothers to contain perfume and that it contains witch hazel, it's not required. Um, you'd be better off if you really felt that you needed to spritz with something. I just use plain uh, cool boiled water, um, but it's not really required. Oh, question. Uh, how is alcohol denatured? Crikey, it's a long time since I've done chemistry. I have to confess, I can't remember how alcohol is denatured. Um, most things are denatured by either heat or pressure. Um, so maybe it's boiled. I don't know the answer to that one, I'm afraid. Um, I am going to move on in my list of things I wanted to cover. Hot flushes. Basically, they're a thing. They happen. Um, while your body's pregnant, you have a high level of estrogen circulating. And then when baby comes out and the placenta comes out, that estrogen level crashes. So it's extremely common for people, for mums to get hot flushes. Um, maybe not day one, but day two, day three. And that can last anything up to a couple of weeks as that estrogen level really plummets. Um, they're often worse at night. Um, and there's not a great deal you can do about it other than keep yourself cool. So things that help there, stripping off window open if you want to wear pajamas or you need to wear nightwear or bedding um cotton natural fibers uh avoid polyester and that will help just keep you a little bit cooler but do nothing and and they will still settle um but they can happen with different severities different ladies we don't know why <clears throat> mental health so perinatal mental health is a pet subject of mine i am the perinatal mental health gp champion for Oxfordshire. And I have, um, over the last six months, been training uh, all the GPs across Oxfordshire about perinatal mental health resources, about antidepressants, about anxiety medications, um, and, uh, yeah, trying to, to bring up the standard of training a little bit for perinatal mental health. Um, Dr Yusuf, I believe, is doing a session tomorrow. He's a fantastic psychiatrist. Um, he covers um, basically while you're under the care of the midwives. So I'm sure he'll go over this tomorrow as well. Um, but essentially what happens if you're under the community mental health team before pregnancy or you've been under them in the past, what happens when you're pregnant or you're thinking about becoming pregnant or this is kind of on your horizon? Us as GPs would like to refer you to the perinatal mental health team. And then the perinatal team will accept referrals from preconception all the way through to uh, baby being one year old. Or they like to receive the referrals a little bit in advance of baby being one, because in theory, once baby reaches age one, they'll hand you back to the community mental health team. And they'll very much do that in a joined up way. Um, they're not going to just turf you. Um, they'll just be very practical. And I've been really impressed with the standard of their care and how they integrate with the community mental health teams. Um, so uh, one of the things, um, given this is postnatal health, um, baby blues, postnatal depression and postnatal anxiety. So there's a lot of crossover between those three topics um, and, and how mums feel. Baby blues is a condition that is extremely common <clears throat> and it tends to present within day three or four. Um, but there's a range here. So some women find... Um, it affects them sooner. Some don't get baby blues until maybe 10 or 14 days, but it's extremely common. Um, I would say in my experience, it affects almost everybody. And really baby blues is um, is tearfulness, is exhaustion, um, it's feeling of being overwhelmed, Some sometimes some feelings of guilt. But the fundamental differences between baby blues and postnatal depression, one is uh, hope for the future. So with baby blues, often people, often mums have uh, quite good insight into, I feel okay, but I'm finding this really hard. I'm really crying lots, but I think it's going to be okay. Postnatal depression, not so much that. Um, often symptoms are more severe. They can come on, obviously it can be uh, during pregnancy, so antenatal depression carrying through. It can be nothing antenatal. Um, and then around labour, particularly if there's a difficult labour, or just the birth isn't how mum wanted it to be, or various things. Um, postnatal depression can start any time, really. From a medical point of view, we define postnatal depression 
as happening from birth up to the first year of baby's life. Uh, so baby turning one. Um, there's some debate as to whether you extend that or not. Um, for me, professionally, it's about if the depression is related to the birth. Um, so I don't really care if it presents when baby's five, when baby's 20. If it's clearly related to the postnatal time, it's postnatal depression. But that's just a title. And what matters is what your symptoms are and how what help you can get. Um, so symptoms of postnatal depression that make a difference to baby blues really are the lack of motivation, extremely poor concentration, hopelessness, suicidal thoughts. Those are things that you don't really get with baby blues. Um, uh, they, for me, they much more mark out a, um, a, a direction perhaps of, of postnatal depression. And, and really, again, like I was saying, it's just a label. What it tells me is this mum needs more support. And it doesn't really matter if it's baby blues or postnatal depression. You need more support. And that's what we have to provide. Postnatal anxiety, again, similar. Um, you could be antenatal, uh, uh, preconception. And it might have been bubbling for a while or it might never have been. Um, hang on, I can see a little it's being up there. It's okay. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so postnatal anxiety, again, very, very common. Underrecognised. It's a hugely anxious time in life. Um, so much change, so much to get your head around. All the time you're completely exhausted. Your your personal dynamics change. If you're in a relationship, your dy dynamics change. If you're a mum already, that dynamic has changed. Hugely worrying, lots to lots to think about. Um, a very anxious time. And again, I think postnatal anxiety is really uh, under-recognised. And what matters is not the title, not whether you're severe enough to warrant a diagnosis, but if you need more support. So my plea really is if you think things aren't right, tell someone. To start with, it doesn't really matter who you tell, but, but tell someone, um, you know, preferably someone who knows you, someone who's with you, who can be supportive of you. But if those people aren't in your bubble, then tell your GP. Or even if they are in your bubble, still tell your GP. I want to know <coughs> if my patients are having a hard time postnatal or postpartum. I want to know because there's a lot of resources, you know, that I can direct you to. Um, so, so ask, really. And at the moment with coronavirus, um, as you know, we're not really seeing many patients. We're doing lots by telephone triage. And some of the things are by e-consulting, um, which can be hard to write down how you feel. But you don't have to write much. Just had a baby. I don't feel right. Please call me. I will be on the phone. <laughs> Your GP will be on the phone. And, uh, you know, you just... And slowly, slowly, uh, you know, the information will come out. I was thinking about this earlier about how now we, we phone patients. So you don't have a, a dedicated time, perhaps, when you, you know to expect the call. So I love a list. I love it when my patients bring a list because I know what their, their concerns are, and what their expectations are um, or what what your questions really. Um, so if you're particularly if you're feeling low in mood, if you're anxious, if you feel things just aren't right, jot down a list because then you can keep that with you. And when the GP phones, if whatever you've been doing, whether you're changing a nappy, um, you're in the middle of a feed, you can you can say, well, this is this is my issues and, and it will take your brain back there. Um, uh, so I love a list. Um, I can see a question here. Have you found baby blues? Postnatal depression has been more common than the changes with coronavirus. I'm due in four weeks. Oh, hang on. I can't see the rest of that question. Uh, but in terms of has we found baby blues postnatal depression more common lately? Um, no, I don't think I have, to be honest. I think um, anxiety, anxiety is sort of off the charts for everyone at the moment. Um, so that has been an issue. Um, but a lot of it is is having a conversation. And for me to be able to remind you, uh, mums and little babies, that actually when you're young, fit, pregnant um your baby is is healthy actually this is a minor respiratory illness um you're not likely to need to be hospitalized you need to eat your five fruit and veg a day you need to drink loads of water um and you need to get sleep whenever you can which is really hard when you've got a tiny baby um and you need to talk about your worries 
um, is really, really important um, because a lot of people are phoning us at the surgery now really, you know, in a spin about what do I do this? Do I need to wear a mask? Do I da, da, da? And actually what what we have to do is remind ourselves this is this is a minor respiratory illness for the majority of people. And actually, if you can breastfeed your baby, breastfeed your baby, because even if you get coronavirus, if you can feed your baby, uh, you're going to give your baby antibodies. Um, so I try and turn the anxiety into something you can use to direct your worry and think, well, actually, look, even if I if I get this, sorry, my battery's just going low. Let me just grab the charger. If you if you do contract coronavirus, sorry, hang on. Then, there we go. Um, uh, yeah, actually, it, it's a minor. Oh, sorry, it's just come out again. There we go. Um, it's a minor respiratory illness, and um, you and baby are likely to remain well. Um, so, uh, my favourite to resources. Um, oh, well, let me just turn my page so I keep up to date with things. Um, the Royal College of GPs um, has got a fantastic perinatal mental health toolkit. So if you Google RCGP, so Royal College of GPs, but RCGP does it, RCGP perinatal, um, the top link on that, um, you'll see the perinatal toolkit. And if you go into that, you'll see there's resources for professionals, there's resources for mums and their babies, there's um, there's a whole list of sections. And basically within the um, resources for women and their families, I think it says, um, there's a list of national websites and there's some local websites. The Royal College of Psychiatrists have got some really good leaflets, um, very reliable information, very trustworthy, very well written. They don't print out very well, um, but uh, really, really good. Um, so RCGP Perinatal is one. Um, Oxfordshire Mind. Again, we're really lucky in Oxfordshire. Um, we have uh, Mind, National Mental Health Charity, and the Oxfordshire branch is very active. So their website is fantastic. They do loads of peer support groups, craft groups, and at the moment they've switched to doing most of those online. Um, so I don't know, some of them I know you Zoom. Um, they're free um, and they're really great. Um, there's also, um, obviously this is, for later in your, your little one's life. But um, Young Mind is a fabulous resource for parenting things. So parents of children with anxiety or post uh, <laughs> or depression, um, self-esteem issues. Young Mind has a really great section, A, for the children, but B, for the parents. So how parents can help their children with whatever. Um, really, really fabulous. Um, talking Space offer our um, NHS counselling in Oxfordshire and their website's fab. Um, they have a section, again, one of my favourites. Um, uh, if you Google talking space, other resources. What you'll get come up, um, again, I think it's a top link or maybe that's me because I just click it all the time. <laughs> um, talking space, other resources. It's in three sections. The top section has a reading list. Um, so for the hardback books, which you will be able to get from the library once the library's reopened or you can get from whatever bookshop. Um, the second section is um, a list of websites. So self-help websites, they're free to access, really, really good. One of my favourites is Mood Juice. It's a Scottish uh, website full of self-help resources. It's fabulous. Um, all sorts of different sections for anxiety, depression, obsession, obsessions and compulsions. And there's other things like grief. Um, and bereavement, family stress, and then the more si uh, significant mental health um, illnesses, so bipolar, affective disorder, schizophrenia, psychosis. Um, but yeah, mood juice is really fab. Um, Oxpip. So I, you may have heard of Oxpip. Um, we're really lucky in Oxfordshire. I say that quite a lot, don't I? <laughs> I think we really are. We have a lot of resources. Um, Oxpip is Oxford Parent Infant Project. Um, they're a national, well, they're um, a group of a national charity. They, we, there's Ox there's a Parent Infant Project, I think, in Newcastle, another one somewhere, like Herefordshire, somewhere like that. So we're quite a unique county in having access to Oxpip. And Oxpip is run by um, a wonderful team, mostly psychologists, um, and they're, they're a charity. Their website is self-referral, or you can be referred by a health visitor or a midwife. Um, you, if you Google Oxpip, O-X-P-I-P, -P, it'll come up. Um, and what they do is uh, video interaction guidance, baby massage. 
So where mum or dad might not be bonding with baby, or there's other things like consistent cry, persistent crying, or you just feel that you're not quite getting to grips with what your baby needs, or things aren't quite going right, Oxpip, fantastic. Um, and they're very low cost for what they do, and they have sites all around the county, and uh, really a, a resource we're very lucky to have. Um, my final website that I use, again, is another national charity. It's nopanic.org. And um, there's, there's lots of anxiety charities out there that you'll be able to find, but nopanic.org has got a fantastic section about getting help. And in that getting help section, there's a, um, a, vo a voice recording, basically a five minute voice recording for what to do if you're in a crisis. And it basically talks you through what's happening when you're having a panic attack talks you through breathing she's very calm in fact her voice is a bit husky <laughs> um and uh really just talks you kind of down through your panic attack um it's free obviously you can listen to it whenever you want um it's and they've got some guided um meditations on there some progressive muscle relaxation uh things um really excellent so that's nopanic.org so rcgp perinatal toolkit oxpip Talking space, other resources, what's just your mind and no panic. Uh, couple, come back to a couple of questions now. Is Naproxen okay to take for postpartum bleeding? I've got endometriosis and really worried about the pain of this. So postpartum bleeding on its own, it's not painful. It's just not really that painful. Um, there's a lot of it. It's not painful like period pain as such. There's just a lot of bleeding because the surface area of your placenta, which is like a dinner plate, has to shrink down and that that's just just bleeding basically until it's completely contracted down so your endometriosis pain that you get is quite different to the bleeding that you're going to get um postpartum it is fine to take ibuprofen and naproxen or other NSAIDs postpartum um safe to have whether you're breastfeeding or not um and what we think is that drugs like naproxen um they make the contraction less painful the contraction still happens but it's less painful so you're not going to increase your bleeding by taking naproxen um, and you might inc you, you will reduce your pain, um, particularly pain of contraction. Um, so um, I think I hope that answers the question. Um, but also you can have a look at um, Breastfeeding Network. So that's got all the information about um, uh, basically drugs, um, postpartum. Um, it applies to, it, obviously it's, it's written with breastfeeding in mind, but breastfeeding is postpartum activity on the whole um so it, it should uh, should answer your questions and there's also the uh, bumps resource so um best use of medicine in pregnancy um part of the uk teratology information service so that's what we use as doctors um as uh, to tell us what medications are safe in pregnancy which trimester what they do so we can advise you on risk um so um yeah, hopefully, hopefully you should be should be fine. OK, so uh, what was I coming on to next? Um, let's have a look. Uh, six week check. OK, <clears throat> so it's still happening. Please go. Um, so six week checks in my surgery. What we're doing um, is mum, when your baby's born, you'll get a letter to say congratulations on the birth of your baby. Please come and see us for a six to eight week vaccination for your baby and for an appointment for mum as well as for baby to be examined. And how it works, you book the appointment um, with our baby clinic. Um, so you would phone my surgery um, and say, hello, I've got this letter. Uh, please can I book an appointment? We'd say yes, uh, book you in an appointment. Um, so we put, we put our baby clinics on way far in advance. Um, and uh, so you can, if you want to phone as soon as you got the letter, you can. If you want to phone a week before you think your vaccine's due, you can. Um, and we will do our very best to accommodate you. And I, and I think most surgeries uh, are like that. I like hope they are. Um, so how it works, let's say you have your appointment at Monday at 10 for the baby's vaccine. You are, you'll be asked to um, call us on the day if you have any fever, cough or breathlessness, if you're unable to make the appointment. So we can cancel it and use it for someone else if we need to. If we don't hear from you, we'll assume that you don't have symptoms of coronavirus and that you are still coming. We ask people um, to come into the car park, stay in their car and one parent and one baby will be coming into the surgery. And how it works, our nurse will phone um, whichever parents bring in the baby. So whichever whichever phone number we have on baby's notes, um, we will um, we'll phone that number and say, hello, um, our lovely nurse Tess does it at, at my surgery in Farringdon. 
um, as you're talking through uh, any questions you've got about the vaccine, any questions about baby, um, and then she'll talk about the consent, so what the vaccines are. Now, I printed out as well, if you if you Google um, uh, vaccine, uh, vaccine schedule 2020, you will get this document, um, which will be... It will be on the page in your red book already. Um, and basically, this is a list of who has what vaccine and when. Um, and so so you, you can look that up if you want to. Um, but the nurse will tell you which vaccines your baby will be having that date anyway. And uh, which, you know, um, they'll be going in thigh. Um, and then what will happen when you've, you've spoken and talked about everything you need to over the phone? The nurse will say, OK, come on in. And then the nurse will get all her, um, her mask. So she'll be covered from here. She'll have a plastic visor, she'll have an apron, and in last surgery we're wearing scrubs, um, so she'll be wearing scrubs. Um, and then you'll you'll come into the reception area, you'll be met straight away by the nurse, taken into the room um, where, so you can put your baby's um, car seat, if you bring a baby in the car seat, um, on the couch so that everything is wiped clean. And then you basically take your baby out, baby undressed, have a vaccine. Uh, the nurse will give you the paperwork that goes inside the vaccine <coughs> so you can use that to refer back to. She'll document the vaccine in your red, in baby's red book and then you go back and wait in your car. And then what happens, the nurse then sends me a message to say, I've seen Baby Smith or whatever, um, ready for you. And then I will make sure that my room is clean and I've got all my kit on then. And then I'll phone you and say, hello, it's Dr Glover. Um, I'll come and meet you in the foyer. I'll come and meet uh, one parent, one baby. So ideally, it's good if that is mum, because what I'd like to do is do baby, baby six week check and mum six week check at the same time. So it doesn't matter if you prefer, you know, dad to bring the baby for a six week check and mum come a different time. I'm fine with that. Um, whatever suits you. Um, and so uh, you'll come in and I'll, and I'll just uh, ask you about the birth. How are you doing? Um, try and have as much... Uh, eye contact as I can because it's it really doesn't feel comfortable when we're wearing these masks um yeah, so it's your opportunity to ask me any questions you want really um um I'm I'd expect your GP's going to ask about baby's feeding baby's nappies um and any concerns you've got we're going to check whether baby's had the hearing test if baby was breached we're going to check whether you've got a scan booked for um the hips um and then um then we'll move on i mean i tend to ask mum um you know who do you want me to examine first for mums what we will be doing is uh blood pressure uh and examining your tummy i'm not examining for diastasis so we're not examining the abdominal muscles because still by six weeks the majority of women will still have a considerable gap um between the abdominal muscles so um, if you want me to examine, if you want your GP to examine, ask and they will do, but it doesn't form part of a routine check. Um, a quick one. Someone just said, sorry if you've covered this, I missed it. When does health visitor take over from midwives? So usually the midwives will discharge you by day 10. Um, I think they, I think they cover you up to day 14 and the health visitors will cover you from day five. So there's a five to day five to day 14 where you're covered by both. So um, handover would just... Um, Take, sort of take place somewhere in that window depending on what day of the week it is what you want to do um um where was i oh yeah so diastasis so yeah loads of mums have it um we don't routinely examine for it but i will examine for your uterus because your uterus should have shrunk back down to the usual size by six to eight weeks and it shouldn't be painful um so if it hasn't shrunk down or if it is painful then i'm going to be sending you for an ultrasound scan over the next few weeks um usually happens within a week or two um just to make sure that everything is is settling there um we'll also talk about um sex we'll talk about contraception but i'll come on to that section in a moment because there's quite a lot to say um and then six week checks for babies um uh you'll see in the red book there's basically a list of everything we have to do because sometimes it's easy to forget things um i've been doing it for quite a long time and i love doing six week checks so for me it's a lovely appointment to have and i'm going to check the fontanelle i'm going to have a look at the appearance of baby head shape because often babies are born with very strange shaped heads as they come down through that birth canal um or even you know if you've had a c-section they've just had that head just wedged in the birth canal for quite a while 
Um, they just have funny shaped heads when they come out. And as baby gains head control, um, so by around sort of uh, between six weeks and six months, the skull will mould into a more regular human shaped uh, skull. Um, yeah, so but just taking a look at that really. Uh, looking at ears, looking at eyes, looking at palate, looking at uh, lips, any cleft palate there. Uh, so that's where the discussion about feeding comes in. Um, and then we're examining heart, respiratory system, abdominal system, genitalia, hips, reflexes, spine, skin. Um, and you'll see that list in the um, six to eight week check section of your of your um, of your red book. Um, let me just check if I covered everything. Ah, so ordinarily at six week check, GPs don't weigh babies. But at the moment, of course, health visitors aren't weighing babies. So I think it's completely appropriate for you to say, hello, GP. I'm here for my six week check. Please can you weigh my baby? Every GP surgery has baby scales. Don't be afraid to ask. You can expect it to be done. Um, it takes a bit of time and sometimes you have to find the scales because in our surgery there are about 40 rooms and one set of scales. So if someone hasn't put them back, it can take a bit of time. Um, but yeah, let's weigh your babies because there's not many opportunities that we're going to have to weigh your babies. So if you've got any slight concern or you're just curious or really just because you can, please ask us to weigh your babies and we will. Um, let's have a look. What else was I going to talk about? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for six week check. Um, so a lady uh, has asked, can the six in one type vaccines be given separately instead? So I have to confess, I don't know the exact answer to that question. Um, let's have a little look. So the six in one diptet polio, um, diptet pertussis uh, basically comes um generally that comes as as one uh, it can be divided um uh polio hib and hep b they're all separate ones anyway um um they can they can be divided the difficulty with dividing them is that when you give a vaccine um, you have to allow a certain amount of time before giving another immune challenge and what we don't want to do is puncture your babies more times than we really need to. So um, there's no increased efficacy uh, by giving it separately. There's no improved immunity. There's more appointments, more pain, more screaming. Um, so um, we prefer not to, basically, for the, all those reasons. Um, if you want more information about vaccines, <clears throat> the resource that we use is the Department of Health Green Book. So if you Google DOH Green Book, um, that has the most up-to-date guidance about all the vaccines, the schedule, what's available, um, or what is in theory available. Um, and that you will find all the answers to your questions there. It's written for health professionals. It's quite, it's quite a meaty read. Um, so you're welcome to read it, of course. Um, but if you need to um, give us a call to kind of make some sense of it, then the person to speak to is the nurse who does the paediatric vaccines at your surgery. So at our surgery, it's a wonderful nurse called Tessa. What she doesn't know about vaccines isn't worth knowing. Um, so, um, yeah, I'd say speak to your nurse on that one. Um, OK, so uh, how are we doing for time? All right. OK, I'll speed up a little bit. Um, sex after a baby. So basically, um, I just wanted to kind of put it out there that whatever you want to do is fine. Um, it doesn't matter what orientation you are, what you identify as in terms of gender or gender fluid or whatever really, um, or what your partner identifies as. Um, it's entirely about what you want. Um, whether you're bleeding or not, doesn't really matter. Um, you know, uh, it can be sore if you've got a graze there. It can be sore if you've got stitches there. That's not a barrier. You can, you can still do whatever you want to do. Um, you will find in the first few days after labor, um, whether your baby came um, as a vaginal birth or as a C-section, you will have been bearing down for a certain amount of time throughout your labor. So you will have a slightly sore, swollen vulva um, and it's tender, basically. So touching is fine, but just you'll, you'll decide what you want um, and, and what's acceptable to you. Um, you, your partner, whatever really anything is fine um orgasm is fine masturbation is fine penetrative sex is fine everything or everything is fine um we say for the first seven days don't go swimming um because of risk of infection just where that placenta was um if it hasn't completely contracted down we do worry a little bit about that and everything being so soft still um but that's the only thing really we advise against um it's all fine 
Um, let me just have a look on here, see if I, I wrote down a couple of other things. Oh yeah, stitches, um, they're really difficult to break. Um, the knots are tied very tightly. Um, you won't damage them by having sex. Love for that. Um, a lot of ladies ask me, um, ask, ask us um, to check. Um, down below um, when they come for a six week check. It's not a routine part of a six week check, but we're always happy to reassure you to have a look at the stitches, to have a look at the healing, to tell you whether we think it looks like it's healing fine. A lot of people, um, unfortunately, don't look at their vulva until a postpartum. Um, I don't realise how wrinkly and pink it is. It's really wrinkly and pink. Um, it was like that before and it's like it afterwards and there's nothing to worry about and, uh, and everyone's like that, basically. And if you're not sure, um, just ask your GP. Um, your midwife will be able to have a look. Well, probably not your health visitor. They might. Um, you can ask. Um, but certainly your GP, if you if you want them to check, they absolutely will. And quite often, the six to eight week check, there's still a little bit of stitch material visible. There's nothing to worry about. It will dissolve. Uh, we don't do anything about it until the scar is at least six months old. <coughs> um, in terms of cutting out any um. Uh, problematic bits of stitch because the stitch always basically always absor absorbs and I don't think I've ever had a case where someone who'd had a little bit still just kind of getting in the way there um, hadn't absorbed by six weeks um, six months usually by six weeks it's pretty much all gone um, uh, what was I going to say oh yeah um, when a postpartum lady is aroused there's the oxytocin love hormone going on the oxytocin hormone is part of the letdown for your breast milk. So breastfeeding or not, you're probably going to leak a little bit. Um, if you stop feeding, it won't leak much. Or you might not leak at all. You might just get that trickle feeling of a letdown. <coughs> There's nothing to worry about. Great. Means you're enjoying yourself. Um, so contraception um, and fertility. So you, uh, what we are taught is that you cannot get pregnant within three weeks of delivery. Your body won't ovulate before day 21 postpartum but from day 21 postpartum you may ovulate if you're breastfeeding exclusively it's very unlikely that you'd ovulate um, and the lactation amenorrhea method um, is uh, a very valid form of contraception about 93 to 95 percent effective so it's about as effective as using condoms properly um, as long as baby is under six months old you're breastfeeding exclusively and you're not having any periods so excellent form of contraception um question here when can the non-hormonal coil be fitted after birth or other types of contraception or how can sorry i can't see the longer parts of the comments how can the hormonal coil or maybe you're saying implant there oh uh someone's here saying i work with health visitors it's day is 14 days they take over fab so there we go um so the hormonal coil um in theory so the licensing says it can be fitted four weeks postpartum if you're breastfeeding, your um, the coil fitter is going to be reluctant to fit it until eight weeks postpartum because the uterus is still contracting while you're breastfeeding. The uterus just remains a little bit softer. And when we when we fit coils, um, sorry, uh, I run out of hands because I haven't told the computer screen. When we fit coils, we try and fit them so they sit right at the top of the uterus. And um, we worry that with the breastfeeding mums, the perforation risk is a little bit higher. So we try and... Um, and uh and wait to eight weeks postpartum for breastfeeding mums but four weeks postpartum um is is the license um uh other forms of contraception you can start you could start day one if you really wanted i suppose um uh <laughs> or in implant or coil yeah so basically in terms of starting contraception postpartum um you don't need anything until day 21 because you won't have ovulated before day 21 you can start um taking the oral contraceptive pill um i guess you could start day two if you really wanted um we don't generally um but i think that's just because we don't see you um and uh yeah there's, there's, there's no other real reason the progesterone pill you can start whenever you wanted um speak to your, your practice nurse or your gp um we'll check your blood pressure make sure that's okay um and off you go historically the combined oral contraceptive pill so the one containing estrogen and progesterone um was thought to reduce breast milk there's newer evidence that shows that that's only at the onset of taking it so now we do prescribe the combined contraceptive pill for breastfeeding mums and we warn them that uh, when you first start taking it, you might see a small dip in supply. But within a week that should have uh, stabilised and baby will adjust its supply 
to you uh, baby will adjust its demand to adjust your supply um so it's fine to take um implant you can go in whenever you like um uh basically much like the progesterone pill uh you don't need it until um day 21 um but yeah it, it could be put in whenever you want really um it's progesterone is very safe hormone uh for more information about contraception there is um if you google um oh crikey fpa family planning association so fpa.org.uk um on there there's all the information about all the different types of contraception but in particular they've got a really good leaflet about postpartum contraception um so it goes through the lactation amenorrhea method talks about coils um coils basically the um progesterone containing coil so the brand most commonly used is myrena or jades um they have the highest um effic efficacy so of, of as a contraceptive so they're the best contraception they're better than being sterilized um which is why the ccg um is very keen on women who want to be sterilized having a myrena coil um because it's reversible as well <coughs> the question here is it something to wait until the six to eight week check for or will i need to make a doctor appointment specifically for contraception it's up to you um at the six to eight week contraception no, <laughs> at the six to eight week check you could expect um contraception to be a topic um that would be covered but no you don't have to wait for then um you you want to make an appointment week one go for it that's fine um i have ones that have in the past yeah fine you don't have to wait whenever you want you just give us a call um, you don't have to worry about return to fertility until day 21, but um, the progesterone pill takes two days um, for it to be contraceptively reliable. Um, so if if uh, if you want to get it started before day 21, call us. We'd much rather you called um, than, than you didn't or you just winged it because um, that's not a method. <laughs> that's not contraception. Um, so, yeah, give us a call. Um, let me just have a quick check. Did I uh, want to ask anything else? No, okay. Oh, so the next thing I was going to talk about was um, pelvic floor exercises. I touched on it a bit earlier, um, but just to reiterate, um, pelvic floor exercises, do them. Um, three times a day, every day. Um, they are going to um, improve your continence. So stress incontinence um, is a real common problem postpartum, whatever type of birth you've had. Um, basically it's peeing when you sneeze or you cough or you go for a long walk very very common it's it's so common that people think that it's normal but it's not normal you shouldn't expect to have that and actually the best thing you can do for yourself is pelvic floor exercises so there's the NHS squeezy app um, and what I would suggest is that if you do have um, uh, stress incontinence or any kind of incontinence really um, start with pelvic floor exercises three times a day for a month if that's not working it's not enough for you you can either give your GP a call or HealthShare. Um, HealthShare offer physiotherapy on the NHS throughout Oxfordshire. They have a self-referral. If you Google HealthShare Oxfordshire, um, you can refer yourself and you can refer yourself for women's health physio. And so that's basically um, specialised physios to deal with pelvic pain, deal with um, incontinence, um, a variety of issues really, sort of, um, pelvic related um, and they're self-referral and they're really fab um, and not enough women are referring themselves or being referred to these services and sometimes mums wait until they've had their next baby or they've had their third or fourth baby until they seek help you don't need to do that um, we can you know do your pelvic floor exercises see the women's health physio get your pelvis uh, sorted out for want of a better phrase um, before the next pregnancy and that's 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 what you should expect and it's it's a service that's there so we need to we need to access that more um just a brief bit moving on about shared parental leave it exists it doesn't have to just be maternity leave you can share that parental leave with your other half um so um statutory maternity allowance can be you would have to generally you the the mum um who's given birth will be having their statutory maternity allowance or their allowance through their work you would have to stop that <clears throat> including the, the the finances with it and then you can transfer the leave to your other half um i did this um i was self-employed when my son was born and so i had maternity leave um 
I think Taylor's about four months old. Um, and then my husband, with his work, was able to share my uh, parental leave. So I went back and I was really lucky that um, I could do two hour clinics. Um, so I basically would feed him, feed George, my baby, um, fly to work, do my work, come home and feed him again. Um, and it was brilliant. It was great. Um, my husband was around. He could support our little girl um, and support me. Um, and I really think it helped me breastfeed for longer than I would have done. Um, and it was a lovely, a lovely opportunity for us. Um, so I would encourage you to, to think about that and to bear in mind that um, breastfeeding while you're working is possible. Um, there is, let me get it right now, uh, uh, maternityaction.org.uk has got a fantastic sheet. In fact, I printed it out so I could show you this. So accommodating breastfeeding and return to work. And um, it's just a four pager, um, really, really well written, sensible, is guidance for employers. Uh, basically saying, although there is no law here in this area, um, uh, employers are expected to support mums to give you time and space to breastfeed, not a toilet. Um, so space to express, a space to feed, not a toilet. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so it, it's doable. And whether you return to work um, and you're working in an office, you're, you're, you can't divide your day, um, you know, I would encourage you not to think that you have to stop breastfeeding when you go to work. You don't have to stop. Babies respond really well to routine and they get to know that um, when mum's around a couple of days a week, I can breastfeed during the day. And when I'm at the childbinder or I'm with Gran or wherever they are, um, I don't feed during the day. I just feed at night. And babies will still reap the rewards of you managing to feed them. So if there's any part of you that thinks, well, maybe I'll give it a try. Please give it a try because it will give your baby health benefits. It will, it will give you health benefits um, if you can continue to give them any kind of breast milk up until at least the age of two. Um, the World Health Organization advises that we breastfeed until at least two and beyond. Um, it's not that, um, you know, you get to two and stop. Or get to weaning and stop that is definitely not the case you'll be doing the best for your baby you'll be reducing its likelihood of asthma of diabetes of obesity you might be boosting its iq as well um you'll be hugely reducing its rate of infections and we see that a lot in general practice um, um and for you as a mum you'll be reducing your risk of various cancers um, you'll be helping your mental health. You'll be helping. Um, you'll be reducing your own risk of obesity. Um, so the longer you can breastfeed, the better. And so use the um, the maternityaction.org.uk leaflet to help you um, and, uh, and and guide you forwards with that. Really. So uh, that's the end of my section about mums. I'll just do a brief bit about babies because I think I've I've gone on for quite a long time. Um, so babies, uh, babies should wear. One extra thin layer more than you. That's it. Full stop. If you're wearing a vest, baby needs two. If, like today, I'm wearing a long sleeve t-shirt, baby wear a short sleeve vest and a long sleeve t-shirt. That's it. Same, same at bedtime. Uh, sources of sleep support. We get asked about this quite a lot. The Lullaby Sleep Trust has got um, some very good, gentle, simple advice. Um, your health visitor is a great source of sleep support. And Oxpip also. Um, uh, other common things we get asked about thrush, oral thrush, babies and mums with their boobs. Um, Breastfeeding Network has the current national guidance on how to treat or on what is thrush um, and how to treat it. So it's a really well written document. Have a look at it. You'll be you'll be knowledgeable. You'll be armed a little bit. Like I said earlier, GPs, we're not very well taught about breastfeeding, um, about what to do, breastfeeding complications. So if you can come to us, I mean, I'm quite familiar with it because I, I get passionate about this. But uh, and there are GPs like me out there, um, but not all of us are. Um, so if you show them the Breastfeeding Network advice about thrush and feeding, they will welcome that and give you the right prescription rather than just give you some nice statin drops and nothing for mum, for example. Um, 
so don't be afraid to show us the resources um we welcome it um uh final things uh washing a baby don't need to unless your baby is actually filthy you don't really need to wash your baby they don't really get dirty if they're covered in poo or they're covered in vomit yep give them a rinse down you don't need to use soap um you can use you know there's various different things out there um but sensitive for baby and really just water and if you could not use baby wipes for the first two weeks that would be even better for your baby skin just let the barrier skin of the barrier function of the skin just do what it naturally is made to do um uh, uh, uh what else a block tear ducts so um in in adults we have a tear duct just in here this little puffy bit right there and it drains into the back of your nose but when babies are born um that that connection isn't always connected so i think of it a bit like euro tunnel so you've kind of got england and france and they haven't met in the middle yet so often babies get gunky eyes they don't have conjunctivitis so they don't have it's not red it's not puffy or swollen or irritable um, they just get a lot of gunk and what you can do when you're feeding your baby or changing your baby run your finger so i use your little finger and basically you run it all around the the kind of the, the orbit so the bone under here and you run it round and down and press a uh, massage down and what you're doing by doing that is you're stimulating the tears to go down the tear duct and slowly enough will slowly go down that it will become open um that can take six months um so uh, don't worry if your baby's eye isn't red or just seems to be causing distress just massage um and, and it'll settle down uh, final thing for me, and then um, I'll go unless there's any other questions. Um, Cowpole, paracetamol. So the time to use paracetamol um, is when your baby is unwell and has a fever. If your baby is unwell but doesn't seem to have a fever, then you don't need to use cowpaw. If your baby has a fever but isn't unwell, it's just hot but seems happy, you don't need to use cowpaw. So fever is the body's natural response to an infection. And the reason we put up our temperature is because us as a, as a human, we can tolerate a much higher temperature than viruses. That's why 40 degree wash is gonna kill coronavirus because viruses can't, don't survive well above 40 degrees. So we put our temperature up to kill them off. Ta-da, that's the body's, body's doing its thing. Um, if we don't allow the body to develop a fever, the body can't fight the infection quite so well. Um, so fever is a good thing. And as long as your child is tolerating the fever, you don't have to bring it down. So if your child is in their, their cot sweating away and you think, I think this kid's got a fever, but they're breathing normally, they're sleeping normally, don't wake them. Don't stick a thermometer in their ear. Don't give them cowpole. Just let them sleep um, and just let them be warm. Um, if, however, your child is grisly, miserable, clingy, not wanting to feed, just not right, and you feel that they're they're not they're not tolerating this well, and they've got a fever, then you give them some paracetamol and they will settle and they'll feed, which is what we want them to do. We just want the fluids in and the fluids out. Um, in terms of a fever, obviously at the moment everyone is frantic about thirty seven point eight. Um, but actually, as your doctor, I don't really care what the number is. I want to know how's the child. And if you think they feel hot, then they're hot. You don't have to measure it. If you think they feel hot, they're hot. Um, so you don't need a thermometer. You you just get to know your baby, how they kind of run, what kind of temperature they're at. Um, right, I'm just going to check my messages now just to make sure if there's anything else I need to do. And then I will sign off. No, nope. all looking good. Nothing there. I think I've answered all the questions. Um, so thank you everyone for watching. Um, if you have other questions, I'll keep an eye on the comments um, over the next day or two, um, and I can and I'll post the links to the websites I've mentioned as well. And I wish you all well. It's a difficult time in life, and it's a wonderful time in life. And um, girl power. Okay, take care. Bye bye.